But before we get into our study, what do we have to do? We have to pray. So I'm going to pray. I'm going to give you all a few moments to pray silently. And you're going to ask for the Holy Spirit to speak to you directly. And then I'm going to pray. Father in heaven, I ask that you'll speak through the word by the power of the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Now Babylon is our home. Do you agree with that? Now in the Bible, let me bring this over here. In the Bible, you have, you have two cities, okay? You have Jerusalem and you have, uh, what's the other one? Babylon, right? Now, Jerusalem is, uh, is considered very sacred even to Muslims, Sunni Muslims. They look at, uh, of course, Mecca and Medina and also Jerusalem, they hold these cities to high, high regard. And of course, Christians. We know in Luke chapter 2, verse 22, Jesus, he was brought to Jerusalem to be presented before the Lord. Not Nazareth, but Jerusalem. High regard. The Bible even tells us in John 21, verse 2, a very familiar text. Then I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God. It is called the new, what? Jerusalem. It is not called the new Bethlehem or the new Fresno. No way. It is called the new Jerusalem because Jerusalem is highly, highly regarded by the Bible authors. And then we have, of course... Babylon. You know the Tower of Babel. By the way, who was the one who, who, who built that, that, that city, who founded that city? Nimrod. Now, Nimrod was a direct descendant of who? Of uh, Noah. Remember that? He was the great grandson of Noah. So just a few generations out of Noah, um, Satan decides to use Nimrod to construct this city. And the tower called Babel. Now the word Babel, in Hebrew, it is Babylon, okay? So it's the same. And this is where God confounded the language. You remember that? When they were constructing this tower to reach to the heavens. And the languages got confused. This is where you get Spanish, Filipino, uh, Tagalog, Italian, all the languages originate from Babel. Before this, they all spoke one language. Okay? God confounded the language there. That's why, you know, when you have children, babies speaking, we say that they are babbling. Can you understand when babies are babbling? No! If you can understand, that's a problem. <laughs> you can't understand that. It's confusion. So Babylon, anything Babylonian is confusion. Fusion. Now the Bible says in Revelation 14, verse 8, and another angel followed, saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, that great city. Now, now this is interesting. It says, because she has made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. Now, that city, um, Babylon, when John wrote the second angel's message, saying that Babylon is fallen, is fallen, etc., etc. Did Was Babylon, the city, the literal city, did it already fall? Yes, it already fell, okay, around 539 before Jesus even came, all right, B.C. Now, this is referring to the spirit of Babylon. We do know that there is a, a religious system that still follows Babylon, but one day, Babylon will be completely fallen, okay? Babylon has nothing at all to do with Jesus Christ, amen? Nothing at all, okay? Pure confusion. 
You know, my daughter, my daughter is seven. She'll be eight next month. Talking about confusion. Because God does not want anyone in here to have a Babylonian mind. You follow that? God does not want anyone here to be in a state of confusion. My daughter asked me a few, um, a few years ago. She was like five or so. She asked, say, Dad, why do boys marry boys? That's confusion. Brothers and sisters, that is confusion. This is the society in which my daughter will grow up. God wants the mind clear. He wants the mind clear. Nothing Babylonian, okay? Let's move forward. Now we do know that the children of Israel were taken captive. They were slaves, taken from their homeland to Babylon. Hundreds of miles, okay? Here's the map. We have here this arrow. This is Jerusalem. And over here, we have Babylon. That trek, they went from Jerusalem through the Arabian Desert to Babylon. Can you imagine traveling in that heat on foot or maybe on some mules for days? You know when it's summertime here in Fresno, we have triple digits. Can you imagine being locked up in chains, traveling in triple digit weather? You think that would be nice? No way. These folks, from their homes, don't you love your family? Only two people in here love their family? Man, you all awake this morning? I know you're awake. I don't see anybody sleeping. I'm going to ask that question again. Don't you love your family? Yes. Yes. <laughs> Thanks, Norman. Yeah, we're all family. Extended family by Jesus Christ. We love our immediate family, of course. I love my family to pieces. Can you imagine the Babylonians coming to your home and snatching you away from your family? That's what happened. Snatched out of their homes as slaves captive in this foreign land, Babylon. Now let's go to Jeremiah. That was just the foundation there. Let's go to Jeremiah chapter 29. Let's go to Jeremiah 29, okay? Because Babylon is not our home. This is not the final destination. No way. We should not have a Babylonian mind. Jeremiah chapter 29, are you there? Now please follow the Bible very, very carefully this morning. Everybody needs to have a Bible. Everybody. Everybody. As long as you can read, grab a Bible. Jeremiah 29, verse 4. Jeremiah 29, verse 4. And the Bible says, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, unto all that are carried away captives, whom I have caused to be carried away from Jerusalem, on to where, everybody? Babylon. Babylon. These captives, these slaves. Now watch what God says in verse 5. He says, while you're in Babylon, you can do some things. Build ye houses and dwell in them, and plant gardens and eat the fruit of them. Take ye wives and beget sons and daughters, and take wives for your sons, and give your daughters to husbands, that they may bear sons and daughters, that ye may be increased there and not diminished. So God says, while you are living in this foreign land, you can have a house. You can plant gardens. You can eat the fruit of the garden, etc. He says you can get married, you can have children, and you can have grandchildren. You can give your daughter away to be married. In other words, Jesus says while you are in this land, you can have a quote-unquote good life. Because marriage is a good thing. Come on, brothers and sisters. You got, you got to speed it up this morning. <laughs> you got to speed it up. Yes, between a man and a woman, marriage is a good
good thing. It's awesome. I love it. God says you can do some things. Now, that's good. But then God says some other things in verse 10. Listen to what he says in verse 10. Verse 10, he says, For thus saith the Lord that after how many years, everybody? Seventy years be accomplished at Babylon, I will visit you and perform my good word toward you in causing you to return to this place. What, is, what, is, what land is God referring to when he says this place? Jerusalem. Jesus, God says, you know what? You're going to be captives. You're going to be slaves, etc., etc. You can have a life. You can live it up. You can have children. But it's only going to last for a time period of seven decades. After the seven decade, after that time period is up, you will come back to Jerusalem. Everybody following that? You will come back to your home. But Babylon, that's not the home. Go with me to Daniel chapter 9. Your stay in Babylon is only temporary. Only temporary. That's it. Daniel chapter 9. You're not supposed to dwell in Babylon forever. Mm. Temporary. Daniel chapter 9. Are you there? Daniel chapter 9, we'll begin in verse 1. This is just phenomenal to me. I love it. Daniel 9, verse 1. The Bible says, In the first year of Darius, the son of Ahasuerus, of the seed of the Medes, which was made king over the realm of the Chaldeans, in the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, understood by what everybody books the number of the years whereof the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah the prophet that he would accomplish how many years 70 years in the desolation of Jerusalem pause the Bible says Daniel because Daniel was amazing the Bible says he has some books, and they are opened. The Bible says as Daniel has the books open, he's going over the prophecies specifically in the book of Jeremiah. As he is studying the prophecy, Daniel is thinking, wait a minute, the time for the 70 years is almost up. Wow. Brothers and sisters, are we living in a time where we see prophecy coming to fulfillment? You didn't hear what I just said. Are we living in a time where we are literally seeing prophecy come to fulfillment? Oh, yes. We have, we have remember what happened um, two years ago. The Supreme Court, you know, gay marriage uh, nationwide now. This God allowed every single person in here to be alive to see that prophecy coming to fulfillment. And the Sunday law, mark my words, the Sunday law is coming next. Oh, yeah. Now, there's nothing to be afraid of, not to be scared of. When we see prophecy coming to fulfillment, we have to respond like Daniel responded. You know how Daniel responded? You think Daniel was playing games and having a good time? When Daniel was studying and he said, man, prophecy is coming to fulfillment, Daniel had one response, and it's in verse 3. One response. The Bible says in verse 3, And I set my face unto the Lord God to seek by, what's the next word? Prayer. Prayer. And supplications, now watch how serious this brother is, with fasting and sackcloth and ashes. Verse 4 says, and he prayed, so forth and so on. The Bible is teaching us, brothers and sisters, we need to be praying. When was the last time where well, you fasted for something? You know, we like to eat. You like to eat? <laughs> Dale said, yeah, pretty much. 
Everybody, we like food. And nothing's wrong with that. Daniel, he's studying the prophecy of Jeremiah, and he's thinking, oh, man, we're about to be delivered. We're about to be set free. Prophecy's coming to fulfillment. I got one response. I'm going to pray. And he sees God. He prays. He prays. He prays. Because he knows we're about to go home. We're about to go home. Now, we know what transpires, okay? We know what transpires here. They're having that party. You remember that? Belshazzar, he's having that party. You got that music going. Beyonce and Jay-Z. Well, some of you don't know who that is. You old, some of you are older. You probably know like Kenny Rogers or something. So you got Kenny Rogers going, <laughs> you know? <laughs> Kenny Rogers, and they're having this big-time party. Everybody, they're winding their hips. Awesome party. Nebuchadnezzar there. Well, Belshazzar having a good time, and he is drunk, the Bible says. Have you ever been drunk? Well, I better not ask that. <laughs> I don't want to ask that question. <laughs> don't want to embarrass anybody. But I, I've never been drunk. I've never been there. I've drunk some wine before, but I've never had hard liquor. But this guy, he is wasted. Bible says, out of nowhere, a hand shows up. Can you imagine a hand not attached to a body just writing on the wall this morning? This church would empty out. I'll go through that door right there. <laughs> There's no spirits in here. That wall, that hand comes out of nowhere. It starts writing on the wall, and the Bible says, the king is so terrified that he literally knocks his knees together. That's what the Bible says. Bible says that. That's how he's sober. Can you imagine you're drunk, but you get sober when you see the writing on the wall? Having a good time, having a great party. And the 70 years is coming to fulfillment, and they're partying. Listen to what the Bible says that writing said. Your kingdom, wow, has been divided and given to the Medes and the what? Persians. Man, this prophecy is coming to fulfillment. It goes on to say, that very night, Belshazzar, king of the Chaldeans, was slain. Killed him. Killed him. We know what happened. The Medes and the Persians, they came and they rushed that city. Okay? They came October 13, 539. And they came through that open breach. That's my PowerPoint. There it is. And they came through here. And they attacked the city. I don't know what's going on with this PowerPoint here. <laughs> You're supposed to show the demonstration. But anyway, they came through the city. They destroyed it. And then we have Babylon. It goes from 605 to 539 B.C. Okay? And then at 538, Cyrus, he made a decree. Now, now listen up. Listen up, brothers and sisters. If you have been distracted so far, you stick with me from this portion to the end of the teaching this morning, okay? Don't miss what God is going to teach from here till the end. Very, very important, okay? Cyrus gives a decree. Now take your Bibles and let's go to Ezra chapter 1 as we're studying the Bible this morning. Let's go to Ezra. Ezra, Ezra chapter 1, after Chronicles there, Ezra chapter 1, mm -hmm. are you there brothers and sisters, I still hear those pages, Ezra chapter 1, now don't, don't miss this stuff. Absolutely, it just blows my mind when I read this. Do not miss a word. The Bible says in Ezra chapter 1, I'll give you time. I know we don't normally go to Ezra. I want to make sure everybody is there. Is everybody there? Okay. Ezra chapter 1, the Bible says, beginning in verse 1, Now in the first year of Cyrus king of Persia, that the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah might be fulfilled, the Lord stirred up the spirit 
of Cyrus, king of Persia, that he made a proclamation throughout all his kingdom and put it also in writing, saying, now listen to the proclamation. Thus saith Cyrus, king of Persia, the Lord God of heaven hath given me all the kingdoms of the earth, and he hath charged me to build him a house at, where everybody? Jerusalem. Now don't miss this stuff. Which is in Judah. Now watch verse 3. Who is there among you of all his people, his God be with him, and let him go up to Jerusalem, which is in Judah, and build the house of the Lord, of, Lord God of Israel. He is the God which is in Jerusalem. Did you hear what he just said? Cyrus gives a decree. And he says to the children of Israel, he says, you can go back home to Jerusalem. And you can build the temple there so you can worship your God. You know how powerful that is? Come on, brothers and sisters. If you were a slave for seven decades, and the, this, the king announces, you are liberated, you can go back home, wouldn't you be really excited? Just a little bit? Well, maybe you don't like Fresno. I don't know. Maybe Fresno is not the most beautiful. This is not Hawaii. <laughs> Fresno is kind of rough in some areas. But hey, no matter how rough Fresno gets, if I am a slave, I will be happy to come back home. Yeah, man, I'm free. I'm liberated. Get the family. Let's pack up the luggage. Let's go back home. We're free. Listen to how they respond. I'm going to give you an example of people who went back home, okay? Ezra chapter 2. Go to chapter 2. I'd be excited, man. I'm free. Ezra chapter 2, the Bible says in verse 1, Now these are the children of the province that went, now watch this, out of the, what everybody? So it's going to tell us who left, who left Babylon to go back home. Of those which had been carried away, whom Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, had carried away unto Babylon and came again to Jerusalem and Judah, every one unto his city, verse 2, which came with Zerubbabel, Jeshua, Nehemiah, Sariah, Realiah, Mordecai, Bilshan, Mizpar, Bigvi, Rehum, Behana, the number of the men of the people of Israel. Now watch verse 3 just for an example. The children of Parosh, 2,170 and 2. How many people is that? <laughs> A lot. That's 2,172. Brothers and sisters, you know how sad that is? Do you know how sad that is? The Bible, when you keep on reading those three Hebrew boys, Nebuchadnezzar made that decree. When you hear that music, you bow down and you worship. Only three people. Only th You know how many Sabbath keepers were there? You know how many Jews bowed down to that image? The majority of the Jews compromised. They bowed down. Only three remained faithful. The majority compromised. The Bible tells us the second resurrection John saw, it was like the sand of the sea. Do you know there will be more people lost than saved? You know what the spirit of prophecy says? She says, there is not one in 20 who is ready to close their earthly probation. You didn't hear what I just said. She did not say there's one in 20. She says there is not one in 20. That means you can have 20 people on this platform right here. Statistically, the prophet says not one of them is ready. 
Why? Because the majority, they're never right. It's going to be a small few. It's going to be a remnant. And the problem is, with Israel of old and the spiritual Israel, a Babylonian lifestyle is very, very comfortable. It's very easy. See, in Babylon, you can compromise in Babylon. You can compromise there. See, in Babylon, let me show you the map here because I like it. Babylon is here, and then you have the Euphrates River here. So Babylon, we know that the water ran through Babylon there. And so since water runs through the city, it was very good in commerce. You can make a good living. You can get caught up in worldly things. And then we know they had the hanging gardens of Babylon. Do you know how gorgeous this place must have been? You know how, how beautiful this place must have been? I've been to, um, what's that park in, um, that park? Woodward Park. You ever been there and you've been to like the Japanese gardens or something? Isn't that really, really beautiful? That does not come close to this. This was so beautiful that it was one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. That's how beautiful it was. Oh, man, I can't leave Babylon. It's too nice. I can't go back to Jerusalem with those hardships. I'll just stay here, and I can compromise all day. I can go to the restaurant on the Sabbath. I can go to the movie theaters. I can do anything I want in Babylon. I'll just stay. See, the problem is we used to have standards in the SDA church. Standards? What standards now? Oh, no, no. You have churches that watch movies at, in the fellowship hall at night. We don't, you know what I heard somebody say once? Somebody was like, man, the standards, the standards are just so high. The standards are too high. No, no, the standards are not too high. Our love for Jesus is too low. That's the problem. Because when you love somebody, it makes it easy. When you really love Jesus... Let me tell you what happened. Because, you know, I used to, um, talking about having a Babylonian mind. Because God does not want that for anyone here. Okay? God wants us liberated. Because this world, this, is, this world is Babylon. Fresno is not the final destination, brothers and sisters. I want to go to heaven. Only three people want to go to heaven? Man, hey man, I, I want to go to heaven. Man, y'all have breakfast this morning or something? I want to go. By God's grace, I will make heaven my home. But that Babylonian mentality cannot enter the kingdom. It can't. That's why the character has to be transformed before the second coming of Jesus Christ. Because character is not transformed at the second coming. We know that. The sinful nature is transformed, but not the character. Let me tell you a story of um, just an illustration of having a Babylonian mentality. I remember I went on a date once with this girl, uh, not my wife, but it was this girl I was dating in college. I'll never forget it. We went to the movie theater to watch a movie. Now, watching movies, let's just be honest. Is that a Babylonian mentality? Yes or no? Yes. Come on, brothers and sisters, don't be shy. Yes. 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 The movie we watched was full of curse words. Curse words. Is that a Babylonian mentality? Yes or no? Yes. You remember um, our buddy Peter in the Bible? Peter came on the scene, and that girl said to Peter, hey, you're one of them. You are with Jesus. What did Peter do? He started cursing that girl out. Peter said, bleep, bleep, bleep. But the Bible says he started swearing. He started using foul language to prove he was not a Christian. Why? Because cursing is not of Christ. And I'm in the movie theater, and I'm watching this movie, sitting down watching this movie with all this cursing, cursing, cursing. And I said to the girl I'm with, I said, hey, man, we got to go. You know, I, the first bad move was going to the movie theater. That was the first mistake I made. But at least while I was sitting in that movie theater, I had enough brains left to know that's Babylonian. 
Man, I got up, so we got to go. So we're walking to the car. <laughs> I'm not lying. We're walking to the car. I get in the car. She's sitting in the passenger side. You know what she's doing? She is breaking down in tears. She is crying. Now, both of us grew up Adventist. She's in the passenger seat of the car. <laughs> she's crying because she cannot watch a movie full of sex, violence, and cursing. You know why she was crying? Because Babylonian minds, mind frame. When you and I have a Babylonian mind frame, we would cry and lust after the things of the world. Brothers and sisters, the majority of the children of Israel decided, I like Babylon than Jerusalem. I'd rather stay in error than accept the truth. You know how serious this is? Do you believe we're living in the end of time? Yes. You ever heard of the sifting and the shaking of Adventism? You ever heard of that? Yes. We don't really preach those things anymore. But this church is going to be shaken to a point. A whole lot of Adventists are going to leave, and a lot of Sunday keepers are going to come in. They're going to be shaken right out of this church. Not, hopefully not this one. <laughs> hopefully not. I hope you remain in, the Ad, remain in Christ, and you'll remain in the church. But a lot of folks, they'll be shaken out and a small remnant, that small remnant who remain faithful is going to remain. That's it. You know what Ellen White says? I'm done. You know what she says? She says we should strive to be part of the 144,000. You know, she, she actually says that. We should strive to be part of that number. Those people, those people are so serious They'll be living on earth without an intercessor in heaven. You didn't hear what I just said. Without an intercessor. In other words, the 144,000, when Michael stands up and the seven last plagues are poured out, according to Daniel 12, verse 1, when that takes place, the 144,000, they'll be living on earth. Jesus is no longer doing intercessory prayer for anyone. He has stood up. When Michael stands up, intercession is done. Those folk are so faithful to God, they can live on planet Earth without sinning once. Did you hear what I just said? There are going to be a group of people, a remnant people, who are so in love with Jesus, they would rather die than to sin. They're not going to sin. How is it possible? It blows my mind. How is that even possible? To live, you're so tight with God, you don't even have, have to ask for forgiveness. And you know, again, I'm repeating for emphasis. One last quote on the screen and I'm done. She says, we should strive to be part of that group. You know what that means? Bro I want us to be thinking this morning. Do you know what that means? The 144,000, they're not doing one thing that is Babylonian. Come on, brother. Are you there yet? I need help. Brothers and sisters, this world has so many things vying for our attention. I need help. <laughs> we all need help. But you know, by God's grace and mercy and his power in us, every single person in, in this building, every single person in here, you can be part of the 144,000. Now, you don't believe that. I know some of you, you do not believe that because you look in the mirror and you know how bad you are. Let me tell you something, brothers and sisters. Jesus loves messed up people. And he gives messed up people power to have victory over sin. Every single person in here, you can be part of that number. But you know what somebody is saying now? Oh, well, you don't know what I've been through. You don't know my life. I'm a bad person. I'm no good. I want to say this before we read our last quote, okay? Because I mentioned movies and I mentioned music. 
and I want to be very, very clear. We are, not, we are not Christians, and we don't say, well, to get to heaven, I got to stop going to the movies. Check. Let me make a checklist. Check. Yeah, I stop going to the movies. I'm a little holier. I'm going to stop listening to Beyonce and Jay-Z. Check. I'm a little holier. I'm going to stop all of these things, stop gossiping. I'm a little... We don't stop doing things because we want to go to heaven. We stop things because we just love Jesus so much. We just love Jesus so much. Okay, Jesus, I love you so much. I'm going to stop going to the movies because I love you. Jesus is hard, though. You know I love movies. I love it. I love it. I love Disney. It is hard. You've got you to give me power. Jesus, I cannot do this on my own strength, but I love you so much. I need power from above. He will empower you because he wants us to have victory. And for all of you here who are thinking, I'm so bad, I'm no good, I guess I'm not going to be saved, I'm a bad person, there's no hope for me. Oh, listen to what she says. Don't miss it, okay? Don't miss this. There is no chapter in our experience too dark for him to read. There is no perplexity too difficult for him to unravel. Watch how she closes this quote. Awesome. None, how many? None have fallen so low. None are so vile that they cannot find deliverance in who, everybody? Wow. Wow. How powerful that is. I don't care how dark your past has been. That's what she's saying. She is saying to every single person in this building, there is not one person who has fallen too low. <coughs> well, you don't know what I've been through. She says there is none. Not one person in this building. In other words, every single person in this building can go to heaven if you hold on to Jesus. That's the key. Because you can't hold on to sin and think you're going to heaven. It doesn't work that way, brothers and sisters. No way. But if we hold on to Jesus and don't give up, you will be in heaven. Why is that so hard to believe? Why is that so hard to believe? You know why? You know, as Christians, as people, we focus so much on negative things. We focus, oh, I'm so bad. Focus on Jesus, brothers and sisters. You should focus more on Jesus than how bad you are. We need Jesus, brothers and sisters. We need Jesus. And there is someone here this morning who is holding on to something Babylonian. And Jesus is saying to you this morning, saying to me this morning, hey, I love you all so much. I want that Babylonian thing today. I want it today. All heads bowed and eyes closed. I'm going to make my first appeal. All heads bowed and eyes closed. Very, very clear appeal. Very, very clear. If you know for a fact that you are holding onto something Babylonian and you're saying to God, God, I need help. I don't want to be like the Israelites of old and hold on to Babylon and not want to be liberated. God, I need help letting go of this Babylonian thing in my life. God, I need help. Raise your hand. Keep them up. I want to see who I'm praying for. Keep your hands up. Just hold on, keep them up. That's exactly what I'm praying for. I just need help releasing this thing. Just being honest. Keep them up. Hands down. We're still praying. My second appeal. My second appeal is, God, I have backslidden. I have strayed away from Jesus. Lord, I, I need to come back home today. You love me. I'm not giving up things because I want to go to heaven. 
is just because I love Jesus so much, you love me so much, you died for me, but I have backslidden, and I need to come back to Jesus today. If you have backslidden, raise your hand. I want to pray for you. I want to see who I'm praying for. Keep them up. Keep your hands up. See exactly who I'm praying for. Backslidden, very specific. I have backslidden. Keep them up. Hands down. Last appeal. I know someone in here wants to get baptized already. We're going to have a baptism sometime this year. But you might want to get baptized. You can get baptized too. If you want to get baptized, you meet me after the service and we can schedule that. We're going to pray. What I'm going to do, I'm going to give you all a few moments to tell God exactly what's on your heart and be honest with him. Be very honest with God because he loves you so much. Say, God, I love this Babylonian thing. I love it. I don't want to give it up. But because of love, because of love, I'm going to give it to you, but I need help. Lord, I backslidden. I need to come back to Jesus today only because of love. I need to come back to Jesus. You love me. I'm going to kneel. You can kneel if you like. But I'm going to give you a few moments to talk to God, and then I'm going to pray. Father in heaven, oh, Lord, the message is very, very clear. The majority, not the minority, the majority of your people chose Babylon over Jerusalem. And Lord, Solomon says there is no new thing under the sun. In other words, history will repeat itself. And the same thing will take place at the close of time. God, we all need help. I need help. We all need help. I pray for those who raise their hands at the first appeal, just being honest. God, I have something Babylonian in my life, and I know it, and I like it. But dear God, I know I have to give this thing up, but I can't. On my own strength and power, I cannot. God, I need you to empower me to sever anything Babylonian from my life. And God will do it. We have to run to Jesus because there is safety there. I pray for those who raise their hands saying, Lord, I have backslidden, and I'm being honest. I have strayed from the Lord, but I'm coming back home today. I'm coming back today. That's awesome because of love. I pray, Lord, for those who want to be baptized, we can do it if they so choose. And I love what Ellen White says. There is none who have sunk so low or so vile. Lord, we all have hope. We all have hope being delivered by Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Every single person here can be in heaven if we hold on to Jesus. Every single person. God, please give us the power to believe that and not doubt. I just want to thank you for not leaving me alone behind this pulpit. Because teaching the Bible is not a joke, it's not a game. Lives are on the line. Salvation. God, please. You want us all saved? We love you. And may we never be afraid of you. May we hold on for dear life. In Jesus' name I pray, let every child of the king say, amen. God bless you folks. I really mean that. I love you. You hold on. We're going to make it. Don't give up. Don't give up. We're going to make it.